amazing music. Um, I'm going to put my notes here as if I can see them, but those of you who know me know that that's a joke. Um, uh, so my name is Esther Thurman, I'm Chair of Creative and Technology Innovation at University College Dublin. That's a term I made up, it means human IT. Um, technologies that are about people and that are only meant to act as a scaffold around the things that we all need to do as humans to create a better world. Um, I believe in inventing the paradigm that you wish to live, so that's what this brief talk is about. Um, very briefly, I want to dedicate this talk to two of my heroes, one of whom is here in the audience, Jan Lukas, who's three years old. And to uh, my father, for whom he's named Alan Goodman. This is Lucas Alan Goodman of Study. Um, I'd like to talk about them because they are both the future of education. What I know about education and about uh, being a creative, empathetic human came from my father, and I believe was carried forward um, through Lucas and my aim, in a nutshell, is to create the education system worthy of Lucas and his children's children while I still have time on the earth. And as a 48 year old mom, I'm running out of time, so I ask for your help. <laughs> That's my big um, So I'm going to talk about the future of education, what that means. I say that it's broken, and when I say that, I don't mean any disrespect to the many amazing teachers and teacher educators, of which I am I'm proud to be one. It's that the systems are broken, and by that I don't mean to be blaming individuals, governments, funders, industry. It's not about blaming. It's about acknowledging that we simply need to fix it, and we need to fix it now. And that what are called, you know, just-in-time technologies in this world are usually too late or almost too late technologies. And I just want to tell you some personal stories about why I believe that. Um, in the hope that if you don't believe it already with me, you will by the time I'm done in just a few minutes and we might work together to create the education system that's worthy of the next, next generation. And I use that term advisedly. Uh, anyone in the IT or innovation space will know um, that the late Steve Jobs often spoke about the next, next iteration or the next, next generation of technology, by which he meant he didn't want to invest in a prototype of a new, whatever tool it was, the new phone or the new trackpad or whatever, unless the design team and the technology team had collaborated across their various forms of knowledges for long enough and deeply enough with enough creativity and future foresight to know at least fairly for certain that the technology that they were proposing now would be alive and reiterated and reiterated better two generations down the line. Now that's, I believe, just the basics of what we should be doing with our education system and for that we need a long-term view and not just long-term funding but a long-term view and an open innovation policy and practice created by all of us as individuals which would get us there because if we wait uh, for the, either the systems, the education system or the technology to support us, we won't be there. So really briefly, why do I think that? That's a personal story, which is what I uh, promised to tell. Um, these terms that I use in my academic life, radical belonging, creative technology innovation, Hippocratic innovation, um, all these kinds of terms, they all come from my father in a very indirect way, though he was not an educated person. I am, like so many of my generation, the first, uh, one of the, well, one of the first generations to go to college. My father was one of these guys raised in Brooklyn, who at the age of 16, and like all of us Americans who come from all over the place and therefore from nowhere, <laughs> we are of nowhere in particular, he at the age of 16 enlisted in the army during World War II um, to, to learn to fly a plane and to, to fight for what he thought was right for the people of the world, though he didn't believe in fighting. So as a pacifist, he enlisted. He'd never been outside of Brooklyn. He'd never been to Manhattan. He had never crossed the Brooklyn Bridge. He enlisted, they flew him to a farmer's field in uh, North Carolina. He learned to fly the plane there, and not much later, he was flying to the South Pacific, um, crashed, was stranded in the open hour for a long time, um, would have been on the way to Hiroshima um, had uh, peace not been declared just before. That's my dad. He, like me, didn't see very well. And when I was a kid, I'm what's called legally blind, which implies you can really see. Other subject of that. <laughs> the ways in which we describe people, that's another one. Um, when I was a kid, and before uh, they invented good enough lenses that I could see very well, I was always in mainstream school, but I was awkward and clumsy, or I thought that I was. Um, certainly didn't think that I could dance or learn. I couldn't see the screen very well, I couldn't see books very well. Um, and I kind of hid behind these very well with glasses. He taught me that that didn't matter. And he also taught me that the most important thing we can give to our uh, kids and to everyone around us is undivided attention. And that is what he gave to me. So my, my eight-year-old dad and I hung out together all the time. And we looked into and out of each other's eyes and observed the world together in all kinds of ways, in the ways that I hope this will teach others to do. 
Um, and I just want to tell one very brief story and I will end because I could go on on that. <laughs> what I learned from you, um, I learned a few things in the brownies, which I was kicked out of very early on, but before they got rid of me, um, we went to what was called the Father Daughter Camp, where they take you up into the woods, where of course I got poison ivy, but that's another story. Um, and my dad bought the beer for everybody so that all the dads who were forced into slave labor to build tents and buildings for the girls would hang out and talk to each other and sing together. And then we went on a walk, my dad and I. The first walk through the woods in kind of dappled light through the trees that I could see the borders in. And he told me a couple things which I never forgot. Never put the wildflower unless they're at least three. Always plant trees with the heel of your foot and make sure you plant more than are ever had done. These were the lessons from a kid who grew up in Brooklyn, where there weren't very many trees. Then he got a job in one of the towers, the, one of the twin towers. When the second one was still being built, my brother and sister and I were taken up to his daddy's home office. And we stood with our backs to the wall, looking out across vast openness. And even I could see that the second tower, which was still under scaffold, was swaying in the wind. And my father stood behind us and said, Kids, never forget this. Even the biggest structures need firm foundations. And he talked to us about scaffolding and how it's only meant to support the things that matter, and the buildings are only meant to support people, etc., etc. On the day of 9 11, when I had just myself flown out of New York and was very nearly still there, and my sister was still there, and if you come from New York, many people were affected. I had just landed back in London, and a, a gentleman who knew my father rang me on the landline telephone, the number for which I didn't even know, and said, Elizabeth, pick up the phone and watch the TV, and don't turn it off, it's happening now. And I watched the second tower fall in real time. And I remember those words. And then the next phone call I got while we were still looking for my sister and everyone else came from the Fatimas, a group of women I'd been building anti domestic violence shelters in Morocco for the previous years. The Fatimas had found a phone, which was not easy to do, and wrote me to say, This is all our world. It's not us. It's not you. We are together. We are there. We are part of that structure to catch all of us. I haven't forgotten that. That's what this design is about to me. Years later, as my father was dying, like he died over many years, and I was his carer, I used to fly back from New York, sorry, from London at that time to New York, almost every weekend for several years, which is not good for your body or your soul, but it meant I could take care of him every weekend. And on the weeks in between, he would ring me on the land phone, and he would say, kid, where are my servants? <laughs> and I would say, I don't know, where are you? And he was constantly being chucked out of various nursing homes all around up in New York State by that way, because he wanted more like this old grumpy guy who really just wanted one thing, which was to push on a phone, just to push a button and have me appear. And his demand to me was that I create some better technology so that older <laughs> people or disabled people or everybody, without fumbling, without being able to hear or see, without remembering protocols or passwords, could hit a screen and get the person they loved. So I've tried to create that so that he could find his own savings and all the next generation to come to. Um, and just my, my last movie, I learned one other thing from him, which is paying attention. But probably the greatest gift he gave me in all those years when I was insecure and thought I'd never get to college and we couldn't afford my kids to blah, blah, blah. He taught me that one other person paying attention to you and you paying attention back is enough to create the empathy which is in the old Montessori model, empathy is when, when you realize as a child for the first time that the kid on the other side of the mountain also has feelings, also has fears. You can see from someone else's point of view and you learn to be more respectful of others and therefore of yourself. That's why I went into education. It's what I hope now to give to Lucas, though he teaches me more than anyone, but the most important thing these days of way too much technology is for mom to come home and turn off. So that's also an important lesson. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very grateful.